And there's this ongoing resistance to scientific advice. People find these, these diets sometimes on the internet or in a popular book, and then they try them and they experience a number of improvements, short and medium term. And so there's, there's this very understandable cognitive dissonance. I'm, I feel much better. A lot of my parameters improved. How can I possibly be at higher risk of XYZ? Scientists must be wrong. No professional health organization anywhere in the world tells people to moderate saturated fat and replace that with candy or Coca-Cola. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hey friends, I hope you're well. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. In today's episode, I sit down with Dr. Jill Carvalho to delve back into a topic that while fairly unanimously agreed upon within the medical and nutrition fields, certainly still seems to cause a bit of a ruckus in the mainstream media and divide people on the socials. That topic is saturated fats and heart disease, an important topic to kick the year off for a variety of reasons. Firstly, heart disease is the leading cause of death globally. From a statistical point of view, the most likely reason our life is going to be cut short, yours and mine. Secondly, saturated fats, which 70 plus years of research implicates in the development of heart disease, are found in generous portions in some of society's favorite foods. Steak, lamb chops, sausages, deli meats, and butter, to name just a few. So why the confusion? Why the seesawing headlines and constant arguments on social media? Well, other than a societal-wide bias towards the foods I just listed, like many things in science, this comes down to interpretation. Accurate interpretation requires an understanding of the nuance that exists within the saturated fat heart disease relationship. This is the focal point of today's discussion. A few simple but very important pieces of information that you must know in order to avoid being confused about saturated fats and your health going forward. Information that will help you feel more confident in your food choices. I hope you enjoy it. This is The Proof, episode 243 with Dr. Jill Carvalho. Hey Gil, welcome back to the show. It's a, a pleasure to have you back with us. Thanks for having me again. Yes, and another month or a few months goes past and another review on saturated fats comes out suggesting that despite the guidelines, uh, despite the, the sort of communication and, and advice from cardiologists and nutritionists and dietitians across the globe, that science has got it wrong. Saturated fat, after all, is not a villain, but in reality is a boogeyman that uh, we shall not fear. I'm, I'm holding up that paper here and I know that you're very, very familiar with it. I watched your review of it on YouTube and I thought, given how regularly these sort of things are, are coming out, out and how much they can confuse people, it would be a good idea to get you back on to understand your thoughts about it and, and just to help give people more confidence when they do come across similar reviews, which will no doubt continue to, to sort of come out. So perhaps to kind of uh, kick this episode off, why don't you give folks a little bit of context about this new review paper? You know, who were the authors? Uh, what type of review was it? And, and what really inspired you to, to take a deeper dive into it? Yeah, so it was a narrative review that came out a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And um, at, it's now become kind of a regular thing that there will be a narrative review every year, every couple of years, kind of going over uh, arguments for why saturated fat is not an issue and uh, all the scientists who work in that field are wrong and confused. It tends to be a recurring thing and uh, Without exception, it blows up on social media. It's highly celebrated because it's contrarian and it sounds like good news, I guess. And um, interestingly, the, the the review, the narrative reviews that come out, going over the evidence, 
with high quality, with high rigor that conclude the opposite. Those don't make the headlines. Those don't get viral. Nobody on social media talks about them. We actually featured one on the video that came in between. Mm -hmm. So there was one of these these, these uh, narr narrative reviews that came out in 2020. And this one came out now in 2022. Both went completely viral on social media. There was an excellent narrative review that came out in 2021 by Kevin Mackey that goes over all the controversies of saturated fat. And I'm actually going to interview him in a couple of weeks here for the, for the channel. Mm -hmm. He's a lipidologist. He's done extensive work on saturated fat. He's a current president of the American National Lipid Association. And he goes over all of these controversies and he explains them. Nobody heard about that one. Nobody's talked about it. Nobody's shared it. But I think this is kind of how social media works is that the things that are con that sound controversial or that sound um, maybe iconoclastic that sound like different. Uh, those are the things that get the engagement. And it's just maybe a maybe like a sobering view of how things are shared on social media and how we are mm. exposed to information that right. oftentimes it can be things that sometimes the, the lowest quality information is what gets pushed in our face the most intensely. Um, so we mm -hmm. just have to be very careful and um, scrutinize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're certainly right. It, all, it almost seems like we or a large percentage of humans want to find someone to blame and, and want to hear that, no, it was, it was all wrong and we've been kind of lied to. And that, that kind of narrative seems to be one that does get a lot of promotion. And you also mentioned good news. So people are looking for good news. Just unpack that a little bit more. Why would this new review that's come out be considered good news? I think a lot of foods that uh, are common in our society and that, that are well-liked, like butter, like fatty meats, um, like a lot of, well, processed foods also contain saturated fat. Those tend to not be as popular in these internet circles that favor saturated fat. But certainly some of these foods that are rich in saturated fat and in the in the specific saturated fatty acids that create a, an issue when they're consumed in too high a, a percentage. Um, those are popular foods for some of these dietary camps. And so there's this ongoing tension with the advice and with, the, with what scientists conclude and recommend. And there's this ongoing resistance to scientific advice. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I, I partly understand it. I, I don't, I don't blame them because people find these, uh, these diets sometimes on the internet or in a popular book, and then they try them and they experience a number of improvements short and medium term. And so there's, there's this very understandable cognitive dissonance. I'm, I feel much better. A lot of my parameters improved. How can I possibly be at higher risk of X, Y, Z? Scientists must be wrong. There's, a, there's a, a very natural tendency to resist this idea when your own experience subjectively appears to contradict it. Uh, the reality is that there is no contradiction that you can lose weight and experience all kinds of consequent improvements and yet still not be at ideal cardiovascular risk range. Mm -hmm. uh, and this gets more complicated because there are many risk factors, there are many moving pieces, but I think this is one, one component is this resistance and this understandable kind of opposition of what people think sometimes the, the scientific ideas are and then what they experience. The other problem is that people are not exposed for the most part to science and scientists directly. They are often exposed to a sort of a, an internet version of the science. Of course, we're generalizing this, you know, some people read a lot of studies and uh, there's an enormous heterogeneity, but a lot of times what they disagree with or what they're angry at is not necessarily what scientists have figured out, but something that they have been told that the scientists say, which gets kind of weird. It's almost like that game of... Uh, where you whisper something and it, the message carries on and it gets really distorted. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a little bit like that. So that's you know one of the things that we're trying to do little by little with the, the, the videos is exactly bridge that gap and you do the same thing. Bridge that gap and bring the science and the scientists directly to the public. And I think 
uh, this will largely solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people are looking for context? Are they wanting or do you think most people are sort of open to better understanding this question of, you know, in this instance, it's how does saturated fatty acids affect our risk of cardiovascular disease? And what we're going to go through in this episode is that there's a lot of context that matters a lot. And until you appreciate that, you could come to an inaccurate or oversimplified sort of conclusion do you think most people are wanting to kind of get into the nitty gritty and, and explore that or they're just simply looking for a kind of surface level way to sort of reconcile things and and justify the foods that they've chosen to eat? Yeah, I think anytime that you're looking at a large number of people, you're going to have variability. And so I have no doubt that there's different views, different positions, different goals. I think most people do want to know the bottom line and do want to figure out what's best for them in the long run. And I, the, the feedback we get on the videos is largely positive. We get a lot of people who, who comment and say, oh, you know, finally understand this. And I understand uh, some of the, the, the disagreements and the, the, the seemingly contradictory views. So I think, I think most people do want the truth it gets complicated when they are exposed to different opinions and different propositions. Mm -hmm. And if those propositions, if they can't tell right off the bat, if one is more believable than the other, and especially if some are more likable than others, if some are more pleasant than others, then there is a very natural tendency to lean towards those. And especially as we talked about, if they've already experienced some benefits associated with that, it's going to be a very difficult kind of uphill battle to understand the nuances and the different moving factors. But, but yes, bottom line, I think most people, um, I think change and, and uh, hearing things that clash with what we've heard before and what we hold to be true always uh, brings a level of discomfort. But at the end of the day, we all, we all do want to know to different degrees um, what is true and how we protect our health and optimize, um, mm -hmm. you know, or long-term survival and minimize our risk of disease. I think most mm -hmm. people want to know that and want to know how to do that for their families. I don't think, I don't think that's a, um, a surprise. Okay, so let's let's unpack this this new review, and it was titled "Saturated Fat: Villain and Boogeyman in the Development of Cardiovascular Disease?" Question mark. And it was published by Jonas Grip and colleagues. It was in published in the European Society of Cardiology or the European Journal of Preventative Cardiology, I should say, which is associated with the European Society of Cardiology. Um, so by no means a kind of small journal, um, quite a reputable journal from my understanding. I guess my first question to you before we unpack it is when you see something like this that's published in a reputable journal as a as a scientist interested in communicating the nuance and really helping people with their food decisions and as a medical doctor on a scale of kind of 1 to 10 how disappointed are you I would say that I, disappointment may not be the right word because I I partly already expect this since it's a recurrent theme. Um, I think it's I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of uh, the publishing industry and the the quality control. Um, I, so I would say maybe a, a three or a four just because I already expect it. It's not the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I don't and, and again I'm not privy to the the process and who reviewed it and why they led this through. I'm not sure of those details, um, but it's a reality that these things get through to sometimes journals of, of uh, considerable reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, and does that hold us back? Does that set us back? Absolutely. Does that inject more confusion for the public? 100%. Um, mm. I, I'm a pretty positive and pretty proactive person. I focus on the solutions and that's, so I try to, you know, just provide the, the answers and go through it and kind of explain why things are the way they are and the rest that's not that's not under my control, I, I try to worry less about. Mm -hmm. 
It does seem, though, for for the average person who's kind of reading along and trying to pay attention and and make the best decisions they can, it does seem a little bit contradictory or con- confusing for the European Society of Cardiology to have guidelines that are shared quite widely by very prominent cardiologists that um, recommend people consume less saturated fat. And then in this very journal that the European Society of Cardiology is associated with, they come out with a review paper that seems to conflict with that information. Yeah, and if you look at the uh, the other big one that, w- that went viral a couple of years ago, that was published in JAK, Journal of American College of Cardiology, and it was extremely similar to this one. Same sort of arguments, same analyses that they referenced, overlooked some of the same basic concepts, very, very similar. Again, incredibly uh, surprising at face value. Um, I think it has to do with who exactly were the editors that received the paper and who were the reviewers that looked at it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah, it, it's not necessarily th- this review process doesn't necessarily go through you know the people who run the journal of, of the, or the American College of Cardiology or the European the the analog uh, European societies. So. I can understand how it can seem incredibly uh, weird, but I think the 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 the, mechan- the mechanisms and the details of how that that logistic takes takes place um, are are a little less uh, tied to the people who who carry out this work than we might think. And I think, especially when these reviews at this level, because I mean the misunderstandings are so basic and so rampant and so glaring that. My guess would be that this gets, for some reason that I'm not going to speculate, this was reviewed by people who maybe don't work in that field, uh, people who are tangentially related to that research. That would be my guess as, as to how this gets through. Okay. So let's let's unpack those misunderstandings. I think it's important for the listeners today to sort of walk away understanding how or why these authors of this review sort of exonerating saturated fat came to the conclusions that they did versus the American College of Cardiology or the European Society of Cardiology guidelines and other reviews which clearly state that reducing exposure to saturated fat uh, rich foods is a good thing for cardiovascular health. You've spoken on this show and on your show at great length about how important context is. Is it simply that this review and people that are claiming saturated fat is not harmful and has been sort of wrongly vilified are, are failing to consider that context? Yeah, I would be more specific than than context. There are a couple of key principles when looking at really any, any data on nutrition, but with saturated fat in particular, that gets overlooked with this type of argument. So first, let me just preface our entire conversation by saying that dietary patterns rule supreme I just want to start by stating that because usually these discussions on saturated fat go over all of the technicalities and then they mention that at the very end. And sometimes that gets by the listener uh, from the uh, by the listener that seems that seems to that may, may seem like it's an afterthought or something like, you know, like a detail, but that is absolutely essential. We can look at all these these details and all this, these these uh, minutiae of the research, but at the end of the day, getting the overall dietary pattern right is the ticket. Because if you get that right, that takes care of most of the details, including saturated fat. For the most part, conversely, if you get the dietary pattern seriously wrong, having the saturated fat in the ideal range is not going to help you much. So I just want to preface with that very important note. Mm. Gil, can you just elaborate on that? I think sometimes we we may also um, take for granted what dietary pattern means to the average mm. person just kind of tuning in. So when you say dietary pattern, getting it right, and all of this stuff that we're going to talk about, uh, including saturated fat intake, tends to take care of itself uh, versus sort of getting it wrong. What is what is a dietary pattern um, that is getting it right versus one that would be getting it wrong? Basically, to summarize, decades, uh, half a century, if not more, of research 
into the basic pillars that are conserved consistently, consistent and universally agreed upon, a diet that is low or moderate in ultra-processed foods, so mainly composed of unprocessed or lightly processed foods, a diet that is rich in unprocessed plant foods, fr fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds, um, and a diet that is low or moderate in added sugar, so refined carbohydrate, alcohol, and added salt. That's basically the gist of it. And even better than that is to just take a look at the Canadian guidelines. They have this great picture. Just one, one look at that image that tells you everything you, you need to know. And if you have a, a diet that, and there's plenty of room for variation. Some people like to eat lower fat. Some people like to eat lower carb. All of that can fit uh, under the umbrella of a healthy dietary pattern. Um, and if you look at that image, you will, you will see that uh, it's, it's virtually impossible to get that spectacularly, to get things spectacularly wrong if you're centering things around that, that central image. Right. Okay, cool. And to tie that into what we're going to talk about today and really just emphasize something that you have already stated is that when you do that naturally, the saturated fatty acid content within the diet is at a level that is not increasing risk of cardiovascular disease. Yeah, basically by following the, those general principles, you're going to be in the, in, the, in the ballpark right now. Can, can you overeat coconut oil or can you have a little bit too much butter and be a little off, off the, uh, the, the, the key um, hotspot? It's possible, but you're not going to be all the way on the other end of the spectrum if you have your, your overall dietary pattern right. Then it's just a matter of tweaking and get the, getting the details. Um, but that takes care of the vast majority of the of the issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mentioned before principles, and it's understanding these principles that can help us best evaluate this question with regards to how saturated fat affects cardiovascular disease. And you alluded to the fact that these are the principles that are often overlooked or not fully appreciated in reviews that come out suggesting that saturated fat is not in any way, shape or form harmful. So walk us through through that, perhaps a, a kind of high level bullet point list of, of what these principles are and then we can dig into them where you see fit. Sure. I've basically boiled it down to three key principles, uh, dose, replacement, and source. And I can give a little bit more new, uh, nuance and, uh, and content on each one. So starting with dose, um, we all know that too much of almost anything can become a problem, even water, you can over drink water. And so saturated fat is no exception. When we look at what's been reported and distilled from the balance of evidence, for example, if we look at the largest meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, the Cochrane from 2020. What they figured out at the end after compiling all the data is that the effect of saturated fat intake on cardiovascular disease is not a straight line. A lot of times people's, people will imagine that something that might have detrimental effects at a certain dose might be just a linear effect. The more you eat, the worse it is. That does not seem to be the case for saturated fat. It's actually S-shaped. So in nerd speak, we call that a sigmoidal curve. And maybe you'll show the curve from the Cochrane on screen, or maybe if not, people can Google sigmoidal curve and you see what, what it, you'll see what it looks like. Basically, it's very simple. Initially at low level, when you start, when the intake of saturated fat gradually goes up, there's not much effect on risk. Then at a certain point, it shoots up kind of abruptly, and then it just stays high risk-wise uh, as the intake of saturated fat increases further. So low shoots up, stays high. So right away you can see how this pattern, even though it's not that complicated, can generate a lot of confusion. Because if you compare a population eating a high-ish intake of saturated fat to a population eating even higher, you're not going to see much of a difference in risk. Conversely, low-ish to even lower, you're not going to see much of a difference. It's only when you compare high to low or high-ish to low-ish that it crosses that critical threshold of effect and that jump mm -hmm. in the curve, that's when you see the effect, right? So this is something we see all the time. 
It's a common source of confusion. People find a study that reports no significant difference in risk with a change in saturated fat intake. And a lot of times the conclusion is, aha, saturated fat is harmless. All scientists are wrong. Here's the proof. Except you may be looking at the wrong range. So it's very important to have, bear this in mind and make sure that we're looking at the active range of the distribution. By the same Gil, token, yeah. I'll, I'll, I will put that, that graph. I think it's a great visual. I'll put that onto the, the YouTube video for those who are watching and then into the show notes. Um, just to, to kind of be a little specific here. So mm. that threshold, um, if I'm correct, is about eight to 10% of calories coming from saturated fat. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, basically, see, if I remember correctly, eight at eight percent, it was still on the bottom, and then at, at the nine percent point is where it first shoots up. I don't know how granular we can be, how what the level of confidence is with that level of precision, mm -hmm. but that's the ballpark. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at most professional scientific organizations and most countries around the world, they recommend staying under 10% of calories from saturated fat. Some people disagree and think it should be a little lower. The American Heart Association thinks it should be a little lower, but that's that may be for people at higher risk who have high cholesterol or, or established heart disease at baseline. So, but yeah, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the, uh, the, the general range we're talking about. Okay. So, but the, the, the general principle for people to understand here is that unless you're comparing two groups where one of the, the saturated fat intakes is below that threshold and one is above, so your contrast crosses that threshold, then you're unlikely to see a significant difference with regards to risk of cardiovascular disease. But that in and of itself is not, is not, indicative of saturated fat being um, harmless. It's just the fact that you haven't appreciated the importance of this threshold. Yeah, it's, it's we have to be careful with extrapolations always, right? So if you, if you look, to give you an example, if you look at a study where one population is eating uh, or one, one group, one quartile or one quintile of that population is eating, let's say 13% of their calories from saturated fat and the other one is getting 18 or 19, I wouldn't expect much of a difference in risk. So, yeah, the problem is extrapolating and saying, so this means saturated fat has no effect in any place of the distribution. It is okay to say this suggests that there's not much of an effect in this range, right? It's the overall extrapolation is that's where that's what trips us up. Right. There's a there's a kind of analogy that I've been using that I think can help people understand this concept or principle. You can tell me what you think of it. And you might have, you might have um, thought, so, yeah. you, you. you may have used this, um, I'm not sure. Um, it's one that I shared at a retreat recently when I was talking about saturated fat and some of this context. And I had two scenarios. So if we imagine a, an ice cube and there's scenario A and scenario B. And in scenario A, that the temperature around that ice cube is minus 20 degrees. And we, we take the temperature, uh, we increase the temperature from minus 20 degrees to minus 10 degrees. Now in that scenario, you would expect that ice cube would, would stay frozen, right? So there's a 10 degree increase in temperature, but the form of that ice cube is maintained. It's not melting. Whereas in scenario B, we have the same ice cube, the temperature is minus five degrees, and we do the same thing. We increase the temperature by 10 degrees and we take it to plus five degrees. But in that example, that ice begins to melt. And so we can see that in the, in the two different contexts, what happens to that ice, despite the fact there's only a 10 degree increase in temperature in both, what happens to the form of that ice is different. And that's because in that second example, it crosses that melting point threshold. Yep, perfect. And you, you could even add the other end of the distribution where going from 10 to 20 degrees is not, it's still, it's gonna be water in both cases. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a perfect analogy. 
that if we looked at just one of those comparisons off the critical threshold and we concluded, aha, so temperature has no effect on the, the physical structure of water, how misleading that would be. Okay, perfect. So that's, that's dose. What's the, the next principle? Let me just add one thing that I think is very important um, that tags nicely with this, and it's the oversimplification that uh, a lot of times these discussions on the internet tend to be artificially polarized and foods are either good or bad. And oftentimes both are oversimplifications. And so with saturated fat, we see exactly that with people hearing these messages and concluding that saturated fat is bad for us. And I, I get people commenting on the videos and saying, so should I try to eat zero saturated fat in my diet? Hmm. We should not. I don't know. I don't even know if that's possible. It's certainly not desirable because healthy, the healthy dietary patterns contain some saturated fat. All healthy foods, I don't think there's an exception, but certainly the vast majority of healthy foods contain saturated fat. Fish contains saturated fat, olive oil. Fruits and vegetables contain some saturated fat. Even lettuce and kale contain some. It's just a very small amount. Mm. So it's not that saturated fat is bad. Is that it's just it's too much of it that causes a problem, just like everything mm. else. Cholesterol in the blood, glucose in the blood. They, are, they have physiological ranges, and then they, they have ranges where you push it too high and you, get problem, you, have, you run into problems. Intake of saturated fat is not fundamentally different. Um, so just that, that uh, note of caution to not oversimplify because it then trips us up and, mm -hmm. and it makes it harder to understand uh, these kind of practical questions. Yeah, so second principle, replacement. Um, the analogy, now we have a battle of analogies going on. Uh, the analogy we had <laughs> in the video to illustrate replacement was, your, yours was really good. I don't know if I'm going to be able to top that. Um, but basically, we had a Twinkie analogy in the video where, let's say I'm trying to figure out if Twinkies affect body weight and body fat. So I get 100 people and I assess their Twinkie eating frequency and I split them into two groups, the uh, frequent tw Twinkie eaters and the, the sporadic Twinkie eaters. And I weigh everybody and I don't see a significant difference in weight between the two groups. If I take this data and these data and I go, um, yeah, issue the guidelines, tell the population they can eat Twinkies with abandon, it has no effect on body weight, 100% of people are gonna call BS on that. Nobody's gonna be confused by that argument. <laughs> because people are immediately gonna suspect that there's, there are other moving pieces. What else are those people eating that are, the ones that, the, 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 the low Twinkie consumers, what else are they eating instead, right? That mm -hmm. uh, gets them to the same body weight. It's exactly the same with saturated fat. When you look at two populations with a different intake of saturated fat, it's crucial to look at what else they're eating. What, what are they eating instead of the saturated fat? What are they topping up their calories with? For some reason, this concept that you can explain to your driver on an Uber ride, it's impossible to get a number of people to get this, right? We just keep going over and over the same story for years. And people keep trotting out studies, looking at differences in saturated fat intake, paying no attention to the replacement, and claiming, aha, saturated fat played, in, you know, made no difference, so it, it's completely innocuous, and it doesn't matter. To give a bit more detail into this issue of replacement, and uh, what are the replacements and what are their effects? There's the, the famous now uh, 2015 analysis from Lee et al. out of the Harvard School of Public Health, there, was, there were other uh, uh, treatments of this in the literature, but these guys really went at it in a systematic way and really put this on the map. Basically, two fundamental findings from this analysis. The first is that when you look at a Western population, people tend to replace their saturated fat with refined carbohydrates, with low quality carbs. So you see kind of an inverse correlation. As people eat less saturated fat, they eat more refined carbs and vice versa. That's the first thing they found. The second thing they found was looking at the specific effect of that replacement, there was no significant effect on coronary heart disease risk. So replacing the same number of calories, isocaloric, of saturated fat, 
with low quality carbs, refined carbs, risk of coronary heart disease doesn't change much. In contrast to that, if saturated fat is replaced with unsaturated fats, especially polyunsaturated fats, then there's a decrease in risk. What they reported was a 25% decrease for each 5% of calories replaced. Monounsaturated fats, it was 15%, and then carbohydrates from whole grains, so quality carbs, it was 9% lower CHD. Uh, and then the other thing that might be worth mentioning is trans fats might have an even worse effect. So if you, when you look at, at the swap between tr saturated and trans fats, there's a trend to worsen risk of cardiovascular disease on the trans fats. Um, so that's just another, another showcase that this idea of reducing everything to good and bad is not very informative. If you compare saturated fat to trans fats, it looks better. If you compare it to refined carbohydrate and junky carbs, it looks harmless. It looks about, you know, identical. But if you compare it to low, to uh, quality carbs, to, to whole carbs, or unsaturated fats, it looks worse. So it's, as you were saying, it's all about context. So Gil, coming back to this particular review, the one by Jonas Group, um, saturated fat villain and boogeyman in the development of cardiovascular disease, did they not consider the replacement? So when they were looking at folks who were eating less saturated fat, what I'm hearing is that within that review anyway, there was no consideration for, okay, well, when those people are removing calories from saturated fat in their diet, what are they eating instead? You know, it's really strange because they do and they don't. So they go over the studies um, kind of a little bit uncritically with respect to, to replacement. And so they go over a number of analyses and studies where there's no specification of a replacement or where the replacement isn't any better. And they say, okay, the, here, the change in saturated fat was not associated with the difference in risk. Then they get to a section where they pretty explicitly say, studies that looked at replacement with certain foods, especially polyunsaturated fats, did see a benefit, did see a reduction in risk. And they go over three or four analyses. And by the way, they miss a bunch of studies that fell within their inclusion criteria that were larger than the ones that they included and emphasize this aspect. But even within the ones they didn't miss, they have this paragraph or two where they specifically go over those and they find a consistent effect, consistent benefit. And their overall conclusion of the entire overview is that saturated fat has no consistent effect. And so it's been unfairly demonized and uh, you know, we've been lied to and we have to change uh, public health messaging. So they are, th they are appreciating that there's different results, but then their interpretation of that is, well, it's inconsistent rather than interpreting it to say what you replace saturated fat with will dictate the change in risk. Yeah. I mean, I always, I always assume best intentions. So to me, what it looks like is that they, they weren't quite clear on the relevance of what they were seeing and they just did in the end, they just kind of lumped everything together. Mm -hmm. But this heterogeneity that they were seeing is a perfect reflection of what is recommended because no professional health organization anywhere in the world tells people to moderate saturated fat and replace that with candy or Coca-Cola or sugary cereal, or at least that's not what the science says and that's not what most professional, respectable uh, scientific organizations recommend, right? What they recommend is replacing with unsaturated fats and quality carbs. And those are and that's precisely where you see the improvement in risk. So it, th there isn't really, even by the data they did cover, there isn't really a contradiction with the science or with the public health messages. There isn't really any, any controversy or mystery there. It's just that they looked at it and maybe it, it they were, yeah, I mean, I, I think they didn't realize the importance of of those studies versus the ones where people are replacing with an indiscriminate food, which we know in a Western population is largely going to be low quality refined carbohydrate junk foods. Mm -hmm. Let me let me ask you a question before we move on to the the next principle um, on that. 
I saw a, a video from Jordan Peterson on the dietary guidelines oh. yesterday. I'm not sure if you saw that. No. And it's consistent with, a, you know, uh, a lot of the rhetoric, um, particularly from the sort of low carbohydrate uh, crowd. And he was, you know, suggesting that the dietary guidelines are really to blame for the chronic disease that we see today. And I'm interested from you, when you, when you look at those dietary guidelines that came out in 1980 or 78, thereabouts, um, my sort of interpretation of all of this is that when you look at how people are eating today, it's not consistent with the guidelines. Very few people eat according to the guidelines. So it would be hard to blame the actual guidelines themselves uh, for chronic disease, given that not, not many people are adhering to them and not getting close at all. But do you feel in any way, shape or form the the guidelines did not make clear enough what the replacement food should be? So with the emphasis on eating less fat, was there clear enough recommendations as to what people should be eating instead? Um, and if there were, and you're sort of happy with what those guidelines contained, is it just the, the food industry and the environment that sort of ended up shaping the way people were eating and the way that people are eating today? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, it's been a while since I actually read the full text of the 1980 version, but they had a summary with, if I remember correctly, seven bullet points <clears throat> and five or six of those are still 100% defensible vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the evidence. The one you mentioned is the one that was honed back then. They said reduce fat and we now understand it's not about the, the amount of fat, it's about the quality of the fats. So the, the recommendations nowadays are to moderate certain types of fat and to favor other types of fat. But they were already saying all the, all the things that we say now, essentially they were already there. You know, the fruits and vegetables and the unprocessed plants and go easy on the processed junk, all these, the salt, the alcohol, the added sugar, all of these things were already there. Um, I think the, <clears throat> the problem is, um, well, as you said, virtually no one in the, in the West, especially in the US, follows the guidelines. I don't know exactly what it's like in Australia. I, I suspect it's not wildly different. But when people say, and we hear this all the time, the guidelines failed. Uh, yeah, there is a that statement is defensible to an extent. If by that you mean that issuing them didn't solve the problem, I agree with that. Issuing those guidelines doesn't seem to have much of an impact on how the population eats. So that's a fair criticism, and it's it's a, a sobering realization that just issuing guidelines that may be largely, if not entirely, well, reflect the science is not magically going to make the population who, you know, you go down the street and you ask 100 people in any major American city, what are the, the USDA guidelines? They have no idea. They've never seen them. They probably haven't even heard of them, many people. Um, so that the idea that the guidelines are somehow going to dictate overnight what people eat is, is completely divorced from reality. What we clearly need is ways to help people implement uh, like actionable strategies. Issuing guidelines by the USDA is not, it's clearly not achieving that. So, um, but yeah, then some people go, go even take, try to take that even further and say that, no, that the guidelines, the, the health, the poor health of the population is because the, the advice in the guidelines is unhealthy. That's completely unsupported by the evidence. Even studies directly looking at um, guideline, um, how close compliance to the guidelines find that the closer people are and the more they comply, the better their health and vice versa. So it's got nothing to do. And you look at analyses of people in, in the, the latest version of the 2020 uh, USDA guidelines, they had an analysis of uh, consumption in the population and virtually nobody's adhering to what they recommend. There's like two or 3% reach the whole grain intake that they recommend, 95% eat a lot more refined grains that they recommend. So to blame the people issuing the guidelines is, is complete confusion. Uh, but clearly, um, the population is eating very poorly. It's just not the, 
the USDA is probably not going to solve that. Yeah, I, I think in Australia it's it's very similar. Less than five percent of the population are eating in in accordance with the the dietary guidelines. And I will link to one study I know that looked at what happens when general population eats according to the dietary guidelines. It was a study actually out of the United Kingdom called the Cressida study, and they were looking at changes in cardiovascular disease risk factors, and they modelled it out and. Um, their findings suggested that if people were able to adhere to the UK dietary guidelines, which are not too dissimilar to the US and the Australian dietary guidelines, that across the population they could see around a one-third reduction in cardiovascular disease. So um, not a small effect by any means for the for the number one cause of death. And if you have any other studies that have kind of looked at that, we can put those into the, the show notes as well. Um Let's come back to these principles. So principle one was dose and the appreciation of a threshold. Principle two was replacement. What you replace saturated fat with matters. And what's the third principle? Third is source. So um, just bearing in mind that saturated fat is one factor, but it's not as simple as looking at the saturated fat content of a food and immediately concluding that that determines the net effect by itself. So for example, fish and olive oil contain uh, a substantial amount of saturated fat. Uh, in fish, I don't remember exactly how, what percentage it is. In, saturated, in olive oil is about 14% of the calories are coming from saturated fat. But in both of those foods, the overall uh, net uh, uh, effect on health and the health outcomes are overwhelmingly positive, probably because they have a lot more unsaturated fats in there, so the net effect ends up being positive. Uh, dark chocolate is another well-established exception to the rule, very high in saturated fat, but it's stearic acid, which is an exception, saturated fatty acid, that doesn't raise serum cholesterol and doesn't raise risk. Um, dairy is an interesting beast because it's very, um, it depends on what you're comparing it to. So in general, if you look at some of these analyses, Comparing dairy fat to non-dairy animal fats, dairy tends to look a little better in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, but then dairy tends to be outperformed by PUFAs. <coughs> and then even within dairy, there's a large heterogeneity because dairy is this super, mm -hmm. uh, you know, varied class. It's so weird to talk about dairy as if it were one food. Uh, and so you get you get a total spectrum, usually with fermented dairy at one end with the best outcomes and yogurt typically typically uh, being uh, at, the, at the top. And then at the other end of the spectrum, usually butter having the worst effect on serum lipids and um, cardiovascular outcomes per se. And this likely plays into dose a little bit and I don't wanna overcomplicate things, but for example, if you were having 11% of your total calories from saturated fat, but most of them were derived from cheese and yogurt, would you expect that to have a different effect on cardiovascular disease risk versus someone who is also getting around 11% of their energy from saturated fats, but primarily through red meat and butter? Yeah, I would. Um, I think that's been directly shown. Uh, we have studies looking directly at that at those comparisons, at least between those classes of foods, and that's what they, they show. So yes. Mm -hmm. And if you want to take that, um, that point even further, if you were eating 11 or 12 or 13% of your calories from, from saturated fat, but a lot of it was from dark chocolate, for example, mm -hmm. I would expect no harm coming from that because that seems to have no significant effect on either cholesterol or risk. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, these things. Yeah, these things all kind of fit together. Yeah. So, what about if we simplify that and we c come back to the dietary pattern? So, Health Canada, you used as as an example. If if you were going to maybe list or whether it's top five or top three or just a, a few foods, so we're focusing on food here to make it simple for people. Which are the the foods that contain saturated fats, which are are going to have more of an effect on our on increasing our cardiovascular disease risk that we might want to be just a little bit more sort of cognizant of. Butter, fatty meats, 
tropical oils, coconut oil, palm oil, palm oil. Those are the would be the top offenders. Again, it doesn't mean that you, you need to eliminate them completely from your diet. It just means keeping them in a reasonable amount. And one other caveat is that with the tropical oils, I haven't seen outcome data. I don't know if uh, if it's out there. Uh, there is data on the effect on the on blood lipids. Um, so there is, I would say the level of certainty there is a little, I would put it a little lower than for the very fatty meats and the butter pending outcome data. Um, mm -hmm. The suspicion right now would be that they would raise risk since they raise ApoB, they raise LDL cholesterol, but uh, pending that confirmation. Right. Okay. So that brings us back to your first P from our last episode of proof and that not all evidence is, is equal. Um, but I appreciate that, that disclaimer. And it, it, it sort of brings us into mechanism. So you're talking about blood lipids there. Um, and I think people that have tuned into this show and certainly people that have tuned into your show will be well aware of this discussion around how saturated fat affects cholesterol and specifically ApoB and how that can sort of modulate cardiovascular disease risk and um, increase the risk of atherosclerosis, this plaque buildup in, in our arteries. So is, is that the, the primary mechanism by which saturated fat is affecting cardiovascular disease? Is it the only mechanism? Are there other mechanisms that you're aware of? It's the one that has the most data behind it. So to give people a bit more detail. So I guess we could give people the 20 second uh, primer, well, just in case people aren't familiar with ApoB or, or it's been a while since you heard about it. Uh, these fats, cholesterol, triglycerides, they are carried around in our blood. Fat and water don't mix. So the way our body solves that is by carrying fat inside these um, cargo ships, if you will, called lipoproteins. And they have lipoproteins have essentially two large families. One of those is atherogenic, raises risk of uh, cardiovascular disease if those lipoproteins are very concentrated in the, in the blood, in the plasma. And conveniently, that family carries a tag, a protein called apolipoprotein B, or ApoB for short. So we can measure ApoB and get a count of the number of those lipoproteins that are problematic. So that's ApoB. Um, in terms of the mechanism of saturated fat, the most uh, well accepted, the most documented mechanism has to do with the LDL receptor, which is essentially a docking station that exists in many places throughout our body, but the relevant location here would be the liver. And so these little antennae, these little docking stations are on the surface of the hepatocytes, the liver cells, and they bind to these, to these lipoproteins, particularly the ApoB carrying family, and they internalize them removing them from circulation and lowering the concentration of ApoB carrying lipoproteins in the blood, which lowers risk. When we up our intake of saturated fat, it removes some of those receptors on the surface of the, the liver. And the consequence is that less lipoproteins are removed from circulation, their half-life goes up, their residence time goes up, their concentration goes up, and risk goes up. So that's the most well-established uh, mechanism. There, there are some others that are hypothesized things around some inflammatory markers, uh, coagulation factors, other pro proteins that are on the surface of lipoproteins that also determine their residence time and their binding affinity to different receptors. Uh, so there's research on that, but there's less um, certainty, I would say, than the LDL receptor mechanism. And you made a point earlier that some saturated fat in the diet is fine. Um, it's always going to be there and, and the mission here is not to get it to zero. So if we come back to that eight to 10% threshold and thinking about that process you just described there with the, the dock. Um, so is it that once you sort of go up above that eight to 10% of energy that you, you get a degree of this down regulation of that LDL receptor or that, um, that dock to the point where there is this increased sort of uh, residence time or backlog of these ApoB containing lipoproteins that is now sufficient in the plasma to cause plaque buildup? You know, I don't know if this is known, that mechanistic uh, detail. 
I've asked this exact question a number of times and I have never heard a compelling answer. And actually from my conversation with uh, Kevin Mackey, that's one of the top questions I had on my end. And I already sent him the, sent him the questions and that was featured on there because when you look at the effect of saturated fat intake on blood lipids, it's fairly linear, it's near linear. The LDL cholesterol and ApoB go up in a fairly straight line. And, and also if you look at the effect of ApoB concentration on risk, it's also pretty much a straight line. Mm -hmm. So the, the exact mechanistic reason for that sigmoidal curve, I've right. wondered this many times myself, I've asked this question uh, and I've never heard a, a, a convincing explanation. I don't know if this is understood, but my, my hope is that Kevin Mackey being uh, one of the, the top dogs on lipids is going to be able to answer it. So stay tuned. Okay. Yeah. We'll stay tuned for, for that one. Um, sort of somewhat related to, to this and, and our discussion around practical advice for people. Something else that I've seen in a lot of studies um, and, and when listening to, to various lipidologists discuss this topic is that not everyone responds the same way to saturated fatty acids. And some people could be more of a sort of hyper responder where saturated fat increases their LDL cholesterol, these ApoB containing lipoproteins to a much further extent than others. So I'm wondering, you know, is this bio individuality at, at our individual level worth considering at all? And when we're, when we're considering our dietary pattern, the foods we're choosing to eat more of and less of, should our approach be to um, include saturated fat in our diet to the extent that it doesn't raise ApoB above a, a certain level? Yeah, I think that's that would be my bottom line. And we just I just we just published a video interviewing um, Ethan Weiss. For people mm -hmm. who don't know him, he's a cardiologist and he's a, a professor of medicine at UCSF, um, and happens to be on a low carb diet. And we had this exact. Uh, discussion and his bottom line also for saturated fat was just go by your ApoB. I'm sure there is some individual susceptibility difference there. There, there is with almost anything. So why would this be different? Um, mm -hmm. all, even though I just said that the effect of saturated fat on ApoB seems to be close to linear in the the, the metabolic ward trials that that looked at that. I think it's entirely possible that there are genetic vari variations and that some people might have a, an atypical response that might be able to handle a lot of saturated fat with much less effect on ApoB and vice versa. Some people might be hypersensitive. There's also all the other moving pieces like the other components of the diet, right? So we know that how much fiber you eat, how much unsaturated fat you eat. A lot of people talk not about the, the, the uh, absolute amount of saturated fat, but rather this ratio of P to S, polyunsaturated to saturated fat. And there are equations for this. And, um, and so the, the bottom line is all these things um, affect your levels of LDL cholesterol and ApoB, and consequently they're, they're, um, they must affect uh, your cardiovascular risk. Um, and we also know without a doubt that there's, there's different susceptibility. You take two people with the exact same level of ApoB, some are going to get away with it and some are not, just like with any other risk factor. Two, two smokers, two uh, people with diabetes, there's always an individual susceptibility factor. Um, and the problem with, with where we are in terms of our medical knowledge is that this precision medicine of knowing who exactly is going to be susceptible to the risk factor is still a massive black box. There's some things you can use. You can use your biomarkers to get an idea. You can use your family history to give you some clues. Uh, but there's always a level of uh, uncertainty, and we only know when the thing happens at the end, right? It's almost impo it's impossible to predict with, with certainty. So it's a good, good rule of thumb, as Ethan Weiss concluded, and as I completely agree, use your ApoB as a, as a rule of thumb. If your ApoB is, looks great, chances are you're either eating a, a reasonable amount of, of saturated fat or you can handle whatever you're eating. I know you've had a, a number of discussions with uh, experts like um, Tom's Dayspring 
and and others uh, on this very topic. What what's the consensus, or what's your view right now on what a target APOB should be? Let's say someone's listening and they're age thirty with no history of, of cardiovascular disease, their health's in good order. Where should their APOB ideally be? And um, what about someone who, let's say, is fifty five and has not had a cardiovascular event, but um, you know has high blood pressure and perhaps a family history of cardiovascular disease. Basically, uh, we talked about that. I talked about that with Tom. Tom, for him, uh, the the uh, let's say the rule of thumb was under eighty milligrams per deciliter for someone relatively young with no other uh, with with relatively low risk. So primary prevention, um, no history of heart attacks or strokes, no established cardiovascular disease, no angina, not diabetic, under 80. I've heard other people advocate lower, under 60, but that's the ballpark. Uh, for someone at higher risk, let's say if we push to the extreme, secondary prevention, so somebody who's already had a heart attack, somebody who's had, who has extensive atheros extensive plaque, uh, very high calcium score, uh, you definitely want to go lower. Um, under 50, some people will say under 30. It's going to depend on the specifics. That's definitely something you want to work with your cardiologist on, but but it's definitely going to be, you want to slam that much lower than the 80, which is a pretty good, but but still like permissive range for for someone who doesn't have to worry too much. That's equivalent to roughly, if I remember correctly, about 70 milligrams per deciliter of LDL cholesterol. I could be wrong about that, but it's, it's the 20th percentile, give or take. And if someone doesn't have access to APOB, is non-HDL a, a suitable um, sort of marker to to assess instead of? Pretty good. Uh, most of the analyses clearly indicate that both APOB and non-HDL cholesterol are better than LDL cholesterol. Between APOB and non-HDL cholesterol, there's some uncertainty, some controversy. There's a study that just came out a couple of weeks ago that is kind of uh, controversial because it, up until now, the balance of evidence pointed to APOB as the master indicator of lipids and lipoproteins, and non-HDL cholesterol would be a pretty good but not quite as good indicator. And this analysis suggests inverting those two, but those two are pretty close at the top, and LDL cholesterol would be like a fairly distant second. So yeah, I think Mm -hmm. Looking at your standard lipid panel and calculating, by the way, for people who don't know what that is, non-HDL cholesterol is just taking your total cholesterol and then subtracting your HDL cholesterol from that. So basically, it's looking at the total cholesterol in that ApoB family, that, Apo, that atherogenic family of lipoproteins. Um, so yeah, those two are pretty close at the top. There's a paragraph from the Kevin Mackey uh, review that you mentioned I wanted to kind of explore with you and and ask you with regards to lifetime exposure of, of high ApoB or high LDL cholesterol. And um, in this paper, they say substituting 5% of energy from saturated fatty acids with polyunsaturated fats would be expected to lower LDL cholesterol by 10.6 milligrams per deciliter, which could potentially reduce coronary heart disease event risk, risk by as much as 18% if maintained for decades. If maintained for decades. And that's what I, I kind of want to focus on here. Because if if someone's listening right now and they are in their 20s or 30s, they may be wondering if this is something that they should pay attention to when they're in their 50s or 60s, which is when a, a lot, if not most people, are starting to have cardiovascular events talk talk to us about the importance of lifetime exposure to these lipoproteins i would say it's the most important factor when considering cardiovascular risk and exposure to the, this particular risk factor to, to really to all risk factors but this one in particular uh the other factor would be the magnitude of exposure so and we tend to focus more on that uh, the uh, the the public understanding is that the level of cholesterol is something you worry about, but really the, the the timeline of exposure is more important than the level of cholesterol you are, you are exposed to. Uh, 
because this is a chronic insidious disease. It starts at a startling young age. There are reports of very young people, for example, who die in, in war in their 20s, even 18 year olds who already have uh, the beginnings of plaque. In fact, there are reports of in utero fatty streaks uh, in, the, in the embryos, particularly if the mother is hypercholesterolemic. So this is something that happens uh, lifelong, that builds very slowly, and you don't want to wait for the symptoms because, first of all, a very common first manifestation of heart disease, of cardiovascular disease, is sudden death. Uh, there's, a, there's a report from like the, name, the late 90s that calculated, estimated about 50 or 60 percent of people in 50 or 60 percent, the, the first manifestation is a fatal myocardial infarction. They don't have angina before. They don't have um, a stroke or another heart attack. The first thing that tells them they have heart disease is a fatal heart attack. That probably has come down because we've gotten better at detecting it earlier and at managing the disease, but the, the percentage is, is very high, startling, startling, um, startlingly high. Um, so it's not something you want to wait for, for your body to be screaming at the point where you have, for example, angina. That's where you already have ischemia in your heart muscle because the arteries, the coronary arteries are so filled up with plaque that not enough blood is going through. That's such a late stage in the disease the time to intervene and the where you get the most bang for your buck is preventing it early on. Yeah, in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, and then sustaining the healthy range of these risk factors, the ApoB, the healthy glucose metabolism, the body weight, the not smoking, the blood pressure, maintaining these things in the healthy physiological range for as long as we can. That's the ticket. So it's almost as if it's the area under the curve that's yep. most important in terms of the so magnitude of the uh, degree of increase of these ApoB lipoproteins and then the, the number of years that you're exposed to that. Absolutely. There are analyses looking exactly at that and calculating, I think they call it uh, cholesterol years, and they exactly that. They're calculating the magnitude of the cholesterol exposure or the lipoprotein exposure and then the time and it's the area under the curve exactly as you said mm -hmm. okay so the goal is to stack as as many years as we can on top of each other where our apob is at a, an optimal level which you you went through before that that 1990s paper looking at sudden cardiac death and 50 or 60 percent of, of first events being fatal is something that I often think back to having seen my dad and watch him have a heart attack when he was 41. Um, that's a, a, a shocking statistic. Um, I'm glad that there's there's been some some improvement, obviously, but it, it's a scary thought um, to think that that can be the first presentation for many people who develop cardiovascular disease. And it's crazy that after all this advancement, we understand the disease so much better. We have better detection methods, better imaging. We have drugs that are amazing that didn't exist back then or, or had just started the first, the first uh, um, c categories, the first classes of statins had just popped up in the 90s. And here we are with so much more technology and cardiovascular disease is still the number one cause of death in the world in average mm. and certainly in the West. So there's a lot, a lot that needs to be done. Another thing that might be worth touching on that has to do with this aspect of temporality. And this is, stop me if this is going a little bit off the scope of the of this uh, conversation, but this is such a common misunderstanding on the internet. People arguing that, that these metrics don't matter, that statins don't work. And often what they're looking at is these relatively short-term interventions, like statin trials, for example, that really are just proofs of principle. You're taking a middle-aged person with a history of hypercholesterolemia and exposure to other risk factors often for decades, right? With, with, with pretty high risk, that's the, often the inclusion criteria. And so they already have uh, accumulated plaque burden. 
And then you're putting them, them on these drugs for four or five years. And that's it. And that's the benefit you're looking at versus the other guys who have the same lifetime exposure and then just those four or five years untreated. That's the only difference. And you see lower risk of cardiovascular disease in general, of, of major uh, uh, adverse cardiovascular events. You see lower all-cause mortality if the trial is powered for to pick it up or if you meta-analyze them. And yet you get people, sometimes with PhDs, sometimes with some scientific training, arguing that because the number is small and because the absolute risk reduction seems small, these tools don't work. This is just a complete misunderstanding mm. of the timeline and of the pathophysiology of the disease, of, of exactly the principles we just covered, right? Of these, this long-term insidious accumulation to right. argue that that, is, that that five year window gives you a small benefit. Well, of course it does. The fact that it gives you any benefit is, is stunning. Right. Uh, on top of a lifetime of accumulating risk. Which you can, you can kind of really appreciate when you look at the Mendelian randomization studies. Exactly. Yep. It's, it's, it's exactly the right point. Right. I'll let you explain that. So okay. just quickly, <laughs> if someone hasn't come across Mendelian randomization studies, I did write about them in my book, but I don't expect everyone to, to remember, but a, a quick plug, go back and, and read chapter five. But why are these Mendelian randomization studies looking at uh, ApoB or cholesterol and, and cardiovascular disease, uh, interesting, compelling, and, and something that we should be considering when we're looking at the totality of evidence? They're very interesting because there's a lot of technicalities and the Mendelian randomization gets very complicated. But basically, you get your genes from your mother or your father essentially randomly at, at uh, gametogenesis, right? When, when you're when the sperm or the egg get produced, the, 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 that division of the chromosomes and which egg gets which chromosome from mom or dad is, is thought to be random. So looking at people who have different forms of, of a specific gene is essentially a, it's called the nature's RCT, nature's randomized control trial, because nature has done that randomization at conception or at gametogenesis. Um, and so what you're looking at there very briefly is you're looking at people who have lower cholesterol or lower ApoB, not because they were put on a drug, but they have it genetically from birth. And so you can do these incredible comparisons between people who were born with a form of ApoB that is, with a form of the gene that determines a higher concentration of ApoB versus someone else who has a lower form of ApoB and, and the rest of the, and you can run a bunch of complicated tests for, to, to rule out pleiotropy and, and uh, satisfy yourself that there isn't anything else that's substantially different. And what these tests have shown essentially is that they have largely recapitulated the results of the statin trials, except the magnitude of the benefit is essentially tripled. It's three times higher. Why? Well, precisely because your exposure is lifelong. It's from birth, right? So you have right there the demonstration, and that's why uh, you bringing that up was uh, the timing was perfect is because there is no clearer demonstration that the statin trials are proof of principle when you treat someone over five years after a lifetime of exposure than looking at what is the potential, the ceiling effect of this, of, of, of controlling your risk factor long-term, lifelong from birth or, you know, starting at 20 years old or whenever, whenever you can, but the potential is staggering. Um, yeah, three times higher, basically we're looking at a 50, 50% reduction per millimole per liter drop in LDL cholesterol. So if you go from 138 milligrams per deciliter LDL cholesterol to 100 lifelong, that's predicted to half your risk. And every 38 point uh, drop in milligrams per deciliter halves it again. You Gosh. can't underestimate this. You can't under you can't overestimate the importance of this for public health. Particularly if you look at the United States or in Australia, the average LDL cholesterol I'm going to talk about here um, is about 120 to 130 milligrams per deciliter. So there is 
quite some scope for for improvement and kind of um, I guess tapping into that that sort of risk reduction that's up for grabs that you just mentioned. Yeah, there's plenty of room for improvement. Um, as you said, as you brought up, as you said, you brought up the the Mackey um, simulation mm-hmm. of what would happen with that saturated fat replacement. And right there, with a with a five percent reduction from the average levels in the U.S., he estimates a close to a twenty percent reduction in risk uh, lifelong. Uh, and that's that's for people who are about uh, around the average. Maybe for people who have an extreme consumption of saturated fat, they can get an even stronger benefit. Um, one thing that's interesting from the Cochrane review is the that benefit of moderating saturated fat was best explained by the reduction in serum cholesterol level. So uh, this is another yet another form of of uh, conf- confirmation that that's how saturated fat is exerting its effects when it's consumed in excess. And that within that critical range, the closer you get to the ideal range, probably the larger your benefit is going to be. Mm -hmm. Remind me, the third P from our last episode, I think the first was proof, the second was pyramid. What was the third one again? Preponderance. Preponderance. So with, with regards to this relationship between cholesterol and uh, cardiovascular disease you've you've spoken i guess if we're considering preponderance so um you've spoken of the rcts we spoke about the mendelian randomization and then also the observational studies also show that same relationship so that is i guess a working example again of coming back to preponderance or totality of evidence yep absolutely you want to look at these independent um approaches different experimental designs this is how we increase reliability in science is you ask the question in a, dum- a number of complementary ways and you keep getting essentially the same answer, pointing in the same direction, your confidence goes up, up, up. And then with the mechanism being kind of the, the fourth pillar, a bit ancillary, but you know, adds to the picture. We know how it works. It ties into the role of ApoB and LDL cholesterol and LDL and the LDL receptor. Um, Yes, there are areas of uncertainty. Yes, there are areas of ongoing research. Yes, there are questions that, you know, that we don't have all the answers for around the details. But the basic fact that ApoB is a major cardiovascular risk factor, that saturated fat raises ApoB, that an excessive saturated fat compared to a moderate amount, particularly with those specific replacements, tends to lower risk. Um, that is at an v- extremely high level of confidence. What would you say, Gil, to someone that says, okay, I hear what you're saying about cardiovascular disease and, and specifically or particularly events, but is lowering saturated fat intake going to improve my lifespan and health span? Or are you just going to develop another disease instead? There is nothing shown that I've ever seen in terms of a, of a disadvantage or an increase in risk of other conditions with a, with a reduction of saturated, saturated fat, provided that you're replacing it with something healthier. In fact, there's things that we haven't touched on, but there's quite a bit of evidence looking at other types of outcomes also with these same uh, dietary swaps like for example, accumulation of triglycerides in the liver, insulin resistance, risk of type two diabetes, also pointing to a benefit of moderating saturated fat and increasing uh, the, these unsaturated fats. We could go on Alzheimer's, uh, neurodegeneration, one of the one of the um, most well documented risk factors for uh, developing Alzheimer's is a high intake of saturated fat. I would not put that at the same level of confidence or anywhere near what we've been talking about. Hmm. Just because the lines of evidence that we have with cardiovascular disease are much more extensive. We have all these things. We have the genetics and the RCTs. So our confidence is on the ceiling. For these things, I would say the confidence is lower, but you still get the errors pointing in the same general direction. So it's just incredibly difficult to, to argue around that. And I have not seen any uh, documented harm of bringing saturated fat 
from, say, 15 or 20 percent to 8 percent. I, I don't remember seeing anything that gets worse with that swap, unless you swap it with garbage foods, maybe. Yeah, I've, I've been very interested in the saturated fat or just dietary nutrients and relationship with the liver and hepatic fat and actually just had a conversation with Dr. Richard Johnson. Uh, his work's very interested in fructose. Um, but we, we did an episode and dove deep into the literature looking at what happens when you swap saturated fat for polyunsaturated fats um, and the effect that that has on hepatic fat and insulin resistance. So I think that's going up in two or three days. So it'll be up before this episode. But I, I think that will be a very complimentary listen to to this one to again see the effect that replacement um, of, of certain nutrients can have on a different aspect of, of human physiology. Um, Gil, just as we sort of come to the, the end of this one, when, when you sort of sit back and look at all of the, the body of evidence um, that we've been through the totality of evidence. And, and of course, we haven't been through everything, but um, I know you're, you're extensively across this area. What outstanding questions are there? Are there any gaps in this research or specific hypotheses that you would like to see better tested? Yeah, there's lots of, lots of things. Uh, the threshold we talked about, right? Why, why do we see this, this, so, this characteristic a sigmoidal curve. It's really mysterious. At least I haven't seen a good explanation for it. Um, the effects of the food matrix that we kind of touched on with dairy, this is an ongoing area of research as well. How come in some cases there are studies that match for saturated fat between, for example, butter and cheese, and you still see a difference in their effect on blood lipids? So clearly there's something else there and one of the possibilities is this um, dairy fat or milk fat globule membrane hypothesis. There's ideas that might be also the calcium in content of these foods. Um, so all of these, these details of how, why, uh, even when matched for saturated fat, you can see a different effect. Um, uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of little, little things. Uh, the other thing I've, I've wondered many times is whether we're going to see another trial, another randomized controlled trial looking at the effect of saturated fat on heart outcomes, on cardiovascular disease. A common complaint about this field is that these trials were mostly conducted in the 60s and the 70s. Um, I, don't, I think it's very difficult to conduct them at least the way they were conducted for both logistic and ethical reasons to randomize people to a high saturated fat intake and then just watch their ApoB soar and watch them have heart attacks. I don't think you could get that past an ethics board nowadays based on the amount of evidence that we have, but maybe there's other ways to do it. I don't know, maybe if you grab a population that's already eating very high and you randomize and you only lower half of them, maybe, I don't know, or you know something along those lines. Uh, I wonder if we're gonna get, because those trials do have limitations in areas of uncertainty. Most of them are small. Because they're so old, there are questions about the trans fat content. So there are legitimate areas of uncertainty there. And so it would be, from a, from a scientific perspective, it would be really nice to have this tested again and more rigorously. But I, I don't know how that could be done in terms of, in, in the real world. Um, other things that we, we could touch on, I don't know how much time we have, but there are some common questions around this area with, for example, specific studies or specific uh, comparisons between countries that always come up. Mm -hmm. uh, we could touch on those if we have time. Gil, here yeah. at uh, The Proof, we always have more time for you. Okay. So okay. Um, perhaps, perhaps the top two or three, if you mm -hmm. want to to kind of go through them one by yeah. one and let's let's unpack those. Yeah, um, because these come up every every time one of these reviews comes out. And so in a mm -hmm. year or two, another one's gonna come out pointing to the same trials and the same issues that we already covered and arguing the same thing. And so it, it might be helpful. 
for the public to be uh, aware of the shortcomings of some of these studies. So one that key, that's almost universally brought up is PURE. And PURE is a large study looking at a number of, of countries. Uh, long story short, they don't look at the type of comparisons that we already specified are informative. Essentially, their main analysis is looking at saturated fat intake um, per se, not specifying a re replacement. Then they have, in one of the, lo the, lo the later figures, they have a comparison between saturated fat and total carbohydrate. But we already know what the problem with that is. It tends to be low quality carbs. So that's the main problem there um, with using pure as an argument for saturated fat, not having much of an effect. There, there are more issues with pure. Their reference group uh, had an extremely low intake of saturated fat, about, I think it was 2% of calories were coming from saturated fat. And I've tried to simulate on chronometer a diet to get that low, and I, I so far I, I could not. Even going with a completely vegan, whole foods, low fat, like no oil, no nuts, no seeds, no nothing like that, I still couldn't get as low as, as their low, their lowest quintile. So I think pretty clearly what's going on there is a malnutrition group uh, that's just not eating, not getting enough calories and enough um, nutrition in, in general. Because all, the, all, all of their analysis or most of their analysis, in, in comparison to that group, it just skews the whole thing. Um, last but not least with Pure, there's a socioeconomic confounder that is uh, brutal because they're basically comparing countries like Canada and Sweden, which is where the intake of saturated fat is highest, to countries like sub-Saharan, countries in sub-Saharan Africa and rural regions in rural China where the intake is lowest. And so the socioeconomic confounder is massive. Uh, they tried to adjust for it in the supplement, but it's just very difficult to get around that type of uh, of problem. And, and um, another one that's that we can touch on real quick is Minnesota. So Minnesota and Sydney are immediately brought up when you when you bring up saturated fat or cholesterol or any of these things. Um, so Minnesota was essentially an aborted trial. It was projected to last uh, four years, give or take. And it was interrupted after an average of 13 months of follow-up, not because it's no fault of the investigators, but the policies nationwide changed. Their subjects were inpatients at a mental hospital. They were discharged. So their, their volunteers went away. The study was basically aborted. They pulled the plug. So the data is not is essentially uninformative. Uh, the other problem is trans fats. As I said back then, uh, there wasn't as much understanding of trans fats. And so both in Minnesota and in Sydney, people were advised to lower their saturated fat intake and to replace it with a liquid oil and a margarine that we now know was pretty high in trans fats. Um, so with Sydney, that's the main issue is the trans fat in the intervention group. But we don't even need to speculate too much about trans fats because the most comprehensive, the largest, and the most rigorous analyses uh, still include Sydney. They generally exclude Minnesota because it was truncated. It didn't reach the minimum follow-up time necessary to pick up a cardiovascular risk difference. But for example, if you look at the, Co the Cochrane, uh, they include Sydney. And the, the summation of all the studies, including Sydney, is still a benefit of moderating saturated fat. So it's kind of a non-issue. Um, the only thing left is the the, um, the ecological data, and I'll try to address it all, all in one. So people ask a lot about Hong Kong. They ask about the French paradox. They ask about specific populations in Africa and other places that are said to consume a high amount of saturated fat and may have lower risks of cardiovascular disease, or at least that's what some reports indicate. Just uh, without going too, too into the weeds, the problem with these it's called ecological data when we're comparing these populations uh, and there is no, no follow-up per se and there is no adjustment for other confounders is exactly that you have a thousand differences. So you're comparing France to another country, Mexico or you know whatever country that is, there are going to be so many differences. Genetics, uh, healthcare system, uh, the other things that they eat, 
um, their quality of life in general, that it's incredibly difficult to pin the differences on the one factor that you're, that you're uh, focusing on. So in general, ecological data is hypothesis generating. You look at it, you go, interesting, France um, you know, has a relatively high intake of saturated fat and their mortality of cardiovascular disease doesn't seem to be super high. So let's test this in more controlled settings. Um, interestingly, I was looking at this at the France issue recently and they also have a very high rate of smoking. It's like over 30%, about a third of the population smokes, which is crazy high. In the US, it's like 12%. And yet nobody would accept that as an argument that tobacco doesn't affect cardiovascular disease, right? That tobacco has been unfairly demonized all these years and it's really totally benign. And it's the same type of argument. So it just illustrates that with these cross country comparisons, you have so many moving pieces that, yeah, you might have a factor that doesn't necessarily reflect on the outcomes, but that's because the, all the others probably offset it, like happens with tobacco and probably with um, with the saturated fat. Yeah, I get sent the the ecological graphs all the time. Um, I'm sure you've seen many of them, which speak to exactly what you're talking about here, comparing different countries with different socioeconomic status, which makes it incredibly hard to tease out the effect of something like saturated fat um, on on morbidity or more mortality. And in, in many ways, it's more informative to look, say, for example, within France or within a particular population and then stratifying people and comparing high to low saturated fat within that that group um, or that population who are living a much more similar lifestyle in the same environment. Yeah, exactly. Which is exactly what the that Lee paper did. It was all in the US and it was all healthcare professionals. They had the nurses health study and the health professionals follow-up study. So those are all health professionals. So the it's not it's not to say that the, the study is perfect, but it's so much more homogeneous and so many more many uh, so fewer of these glaring confounders than comparing a country to another. The other factor that's worth bringing up is that the temporality aspect, because usually when you're looking at these ecological uh, questions, not always, but for example, when they say, oh, France has a relatively low cardiovascular disease rate or, or, or mortality, you're usually looking at a snapshot in time. It's cross-sectional, right? So that raises even more confounders. It's possible, for example, and I've seen this proposed as a possible explanation for some of these seemingly uh, paradoxical observations, that the rise in intake of saturated fat may be relatively recent and the effect on the cardiovascular disease outcome may be yet to come, right? This is a formal possibility. So this is why it's so important to look, when you look at a good epidemiological study or an RCT, you have this element of the prospective nature. You start with people who are not sick at baseline and then you follow them and you observe the outcome later. So and when we put all of this together and people complain that epidemiology is, is uh, you know, convoluted and it's, it's junk science because there's all these uncertainties, ecological associations are epidemiology on crack. All the the confounders are there on steroids and you typically don't adjust for them at all. So if you think epidemiology is problematic, you should never point to a comparison like this with for this country versus that country or here's a tribe uh, somewhere in an island. Why, they, why don't they? Well, everything is different. The lifestyle is different. The genetics are different. Everything about their diet is different. The exposure to pollution is different. The level of stress is different. The not not a single thing about their lives is, is similar to ours. So yeah, I'm I'm hoping that someone is is following a a, a population or a cohort in Hong Kong because that one comes up quite a bit. I'm I'm sure you've had that thrown at you. Hong Kong have a very high meat intake now, um, and also have a very um, good life expectancy. But my understanding is that a lot of this increase in in meat consumption has. Um, come in more recent years and I've seen people make that argument that 
or really you'd need to track these people over the, the next few decades or, or further to see the effect that that's going to have on their health. Um, Gil, you mentioned before the Sydney Diet um, Heart Study in Minnesota and some of the issues um, with those studies, including um, trans fats being a, a confounder in the the unsaturated fat inter intervention groups. Um, and if we go to your second P from last episode, that was pyramid. And so you mentioned there that there's a Cochrane review, which is a meta-analysis. So that sort of reigns supreme over these individual studies. Um, but someone may point out Siri Torino or Chowdhury. These are also meta-analyses that exist on saturated fat and cardiovascular disease that suggest the opposite, that saturated fat doesn't need to be restricted and there might not be benefit to, to limiting it. Um, where, where, how do you explain the results of those studies? And I'm sure that ties back to, to many things that we've spoken about today, but if someone has come across Siri Torino or Chowdhury or has been sent them, um, how, how can they kind of reconcile those meta-analyses? So there's a number of technical issues with them, but the main shortcoming, and this could be like a quiz for what we went through, um, like all the information we went over and the three principles that we covered in the beginning, the main uh, distinguishing feature is that they don't specify replacements. So they are looking at less saturated fat versus more saturated fat. So for anyone who listened to the episode, this should be a no-brainer at this point, and uh, they should be ready to inter interpret that and and point out what the problems are and what the solutions are and what the the data sets that are more informative, um, how those are structured, right? Perfect. Gil, this has been great. Again, thank you so much for, for coming back and, and thank you for everything that you do. Um, certainly, in, in, in my view, you're the best in the business when it comes to rationally talking about nutrition and considering the totality of, of evidence that exists on a given topic and, and helping people make sense of things. So I really appreciate your time today and all of the work that you do. Thanks, man. Thanks for the compliment. I really appreciate it. I am I am working on it, at it. I'm chipping at it, and uh, I'm not I'm not stopping anytime soon. We're just we're just uh, getting started. And thanks for just all your work. Up. Yeah, we're just warming up. And your your podcast. And now we're we're getting into this love fest of of exchanging compliments. But I love your podcast. <laughs> Very evidence based. Uh, you try to ask the right questions and not to, you know, it's it's. It's one of the few examples out there that is not a diet podcast. It's a nutrition podcast. And there's three or four of those that I can point out, not more. And this is the whole reason that we started making videos was exactly to fill that gap because there's so much diet content and not enough nutrition content. And I think that's what people need. So, And remind people where they can find you, how they can watch your videos, keep up to date up to date with everything that you're putting out there yeah uh the channel is nutrition made simple on youtube uh people are also welcome to connect with me on twitter it's at nutrition made s3 and we have a facebook page that i post some updates on and i post all the videos as well so if that's more convenient for you uh, if you search nutrition made simple on you on facebook you'll find our page and all the videos are are posted on there. So it's an easy reference. Beautiful. Thanks, Gil. All right. Thanks, man. Take care. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a comment on the YouTube videos or a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take notes of these comments when planning for future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. 
That's theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.